Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Blogging Theology. Today we're honored to speak to Dr. Talal Zain. How are you, Akhi Talal? I'm great, Bassam. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you for being here. Talal is the translator of two of Ibn al Qayyim al Jawziyah's works, the first being Ibn Qayyim al Jawziyah on knowledge, and the second being Ibn Qayyim al Jawziyah on divine wisdom and the problem of evil. Moreover, Talal authored his own book regarding the problem of evil entitled Revival of Piety Through an Islamic Theodicy. And I've linked to uh, Talal's uh, works in the description box uh, below. Now, the problem of evil is an argument that continues to resurface and never seems to go away, unfortunately. And I'm sure that many of us have already seen a range of responses to this problem. However, I've invited Dr. Talal to give us this presentation today about Ibn al-Qayyim's theodicy, because I realized that Ibn al-Qayyim's response to this problem doesn't only emphasize certain key points that other responses neglect, but it also masterfully connects the wide range of responses out there into a more uh, comprehensive and coherent theological framework. And mashallah, Dr. Talal also has some original ideas concerning the topic that he'd like to share as well. So this will be an educational presentation, which we hope to benefit from both spiritually and intellectually, inshallah. Uh, without further ado, uh, Talal, whenever you're ready, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, so thank you again, Dr. Bassam, for inviting me. Um, and I really want to um, acknowledge, you know, your input into this uh, presentation and your um, edits for it and for pushing me to improve on the uh, content and the flow of the uh, presentation. So, as you mentioned, um, I, I've been interested in the uh, problem of evil for quite some time, uh, really since 2006. And um, I translated Ibn Qayyim's works uh, because, as you mentioned, you know, it's very comprehensive uh, theodicy. And um, in the, that process, I learned a lot as well as preparing myself to um, publish um, my own uh, book on that. And so thank you again for allowing me to present um, it, both the translation and um, some of the um, uh, viewpoints that I uh uh, raise in in the book. So again, the first um, topic that we're going to discuss is, is uh, based on the book uh, Ibn Qayyim Josiah on divine wisdom and the problem of evil. Now Ibn Qayyim he was uh, born outside of Damascus in 691 after Hijrah 1292 Common Era, and he passed away about uh, you know 58 or 60 uh, years later, uh, accordingly. Now, Ibn al-Qayyim, he was an Ash'ari, and we'll discuss um, what that means to some degree. Um, but then when he met Ibn Taymiyyah, he uh, decided to accompany him um, again for the next 17 years until Ibn Taymiyyah passed away. Now, um, I'll just bring a few quotes about Ibn Qayyim. Ibn Kathir, who was a contemporary of Ibn Qayyim and who's well, very well known himself, um, said that Ibn Qayyim was very loving. He never envied others or caused them harm. He never pointed out the inadequacies of others. He, um, Ibn Kathir was one of his best friends and most beloved to Ibn Qayyim. And I don't know of anyone living in our time who's a greater worshiper than him. Um, and he, he said, may God exalt his him, have mercy on him. Ibn Rajab al-Hanbali, who was also a contemporary of uh, Ibn al-Qayyim, said something similar about Ibn al-Qayyim's great worship, and that even the inhabitants of Mecca were astonished by him because he used to, again, um, prolong it uh, greatly. And he also said that he learned many of Ibn al-Qayyim's uh, books uh, the year um, prior to him passing away. Now, uh, uh, Bakr Abu Zaid, who is um, a 20th century figure, uh, wrote a biography on Ibn Qayyim, and he um, calculated that he wrote about 98 works, uh, 30 of which are extant. And he writes, both the proponents and critics of Ibn Qayyim agree that his books are characterized by beautiful expressions and genuine clarity, and that he also simplifies arguments and this, 
you know, allows readers to be commonly attracted to his books. And his, his books are very widespread and well-known, as you uh, know. Abdurrahman Mustafa, who translated a section of Ibn al-Qayyim's Alam al-Mawqa'in Arab al-Alamin, which is a uh, work in legal and political theory, wrote that his works in, in, in that field, uh, uh, including also Turuq uh, al-Hukmiyya in Sufism, uh, most prominently Madar al-Salikin, and prophetic biography Zad al-Ma'ad are groundbreaking as each marks a new way of thinking and writing in its respective genre. Joseph Bell, um, he also commented on Imam Qayyim. He wrote a book uh, titled Love Theory and later Hanbalite Islam. Um, he investigated more um, Ibn Taymiyyah, but he also comments that throughout um, Tariq al Hijratain and Madarj al Salikin, Imam Qayyim has skillfully reproduced model mystical treatises and manipulated the technical vocabulary of Sufism with the virtuosity of a true master. Now, Ibn al-Qayyim had many works, as you can see, um, but for the main two um, kind of endeavors that stand out in his works, at least in my view, were first that he affirmed God's wisdom and wise purposes. Um, and this relates specifically to the topic of theosy, which we're talking about today. Um, this is in contrast to the Ash'aris, um, who in general, either denied that God had wise purposes uh, because they instead emphasized the supremacy of God's will, or they stated that he need not have wise purposes for this world. Um, the Ash'aris also had uh, a divine command ethics where God's will is what determines what he commands or prohibits. Um, in addition to other um, matters uh, which... Uh, lend them to adopt a kind of, if you will, anti-theodicy uh, viewpoint, meaning they did not seek to uh, develop a theodicy or search out God's wise purposes for what he has created. Um, although they do affirm that God's commandments entail uh, wisdom. Now, John Hoover, who wrote um, Ibn Taymiyyah's Theodicy of Perpetual Optimism, um, states, in his book that Ibn al-Qayyim emphasizes in two of his works, which were Miftah dar Sada and Shifa al-Alil, God's wise purposes, um, in both his creation and commandments, and that Ibn al-Qayyim al jawziya may well be the most prolific optimist in the Islamic tradition. And we're going to come back and discuss that a little bit later on. Now, the second uh, main endeavor that I would say Imam Qayyim had was to reconcile between traditional Islam and Sufism. And I mentioned this because one of his, um, that many feel that his magnum opus uh, was Madar al-Salikin, Bayna Manaz al Iyak and Abudu wa Iyak and Astain. Um, and we're uh, fortunate that um, Ovamir Anjum, who's a professor in Toledo, has uh, translated uh, this into English, and the first two volumes are out. Now, returning to uh, the book at hand, um, it was published by Islamic Text Society in 2017, and I'm very much indebted to Fatima Azam at ITS and to my editor, Andrew, who um, edited, again, the translation and provided a lot of beneficial feedback. And, and um, he's also the, uh, my editor for uh, the um, second book that we're going to talk about. So this translation um, is derived from sections within two of Ibn al-Qayyim's books. So the first uh, book, and this forms the majority of the um, uh, translation, is Shifa al-Ali fi Masail al-Qadai wa al-Qadar wa al-Hikmati al-Ta'lil. And um, again, forms chapters 2 through 14. Uh, the second book is Miftah dar al-Sa'ada and this forms basically the first and last chapter of the book. Now, in this book, Ibn Qayyim um, has uh, many objectives, um, and I'm going to go briefly through these. Some of these we're going to discuss today, and some of them uh, we will not be. But again, he affirmed that God's beautiful names are holy and free from any evil, and that God acts, God's acts of are all good. 
Ibn Qayyim proves um, and, and seeks to prove that the Quran and Sunnah affirm causality. Um, in contrast, the Ashari's uh, deny causality and they um, put forth occasionalism. Number three, um, Ibn Qayyim affirms that God's will is in accordance with his love and wisdom um, and that God has many wise purposes again. Um, the fourth issue um, is that Imam Qayyim responds to Fakhreddin al-Razi. Um, he uh, lived before Ibn Taymiyyah and before Imam Qayyim. Um, and um, Razi was, again, a neo-Ashari who denied that God possesses wise purposes in his creation, denies causality, and denies the need for intermediaries. But he was a great you know, scholar, otherwise very well known. Um, and uh, in fact, Ibn um, Damia read all of his works and as well as Ibn Qayyim, um, but they studied together um, and Ibn Qayyim responds to these arguments of Bakhreddin Razi in detail. We won't be discussing this today. Um, if someone is interested, um, that will be, uh, that has uh, already been discussed uh, by myself um, in another uh, YouTube video. Ibn Qayyim sets forth his detailed theodicy, and we're going to discuss that obviously at length. Uh, number six, Ibn Qayyim addresses the problem of hellfire at length, um, and we will not be discussing that today. But um, he wrote many works like Hadi al Arwa, uh, Shifa al Alil, as well as others which um, discuss uh, that at length. And finally, Ibn Qayyim emphasizes trust in the Holy and Righteous Lord and his uh, decree. Now, the problem of evil can be traditionally framed as uh, the fact that God is omnipotent, God is omniscient, God is all good, and yet evil exists. And, and so um, many uh, theodicies, now theodicy is a Greek-derived word. Theos means um, God, and then uh, the latter half of the word um, means justice. And so what you're trying to seek through a the Odyssey is God's justice in allowing evil to exist. Now, Ibn Qayyim, he basically maintains that these wise purposes of God in allowing the existence of evil is so that um, the wise manifestation of the consequences of God's beautiful names can occur, at, uh, divine names, uh, the Odyssey, as we'll discuss. And secondly, evil allows um, indirectly the emergence of greater goods and more beloved goods to God. Ibn Qayyim also seems to suggest that the problem of evil can lead those who are less re religious to fall into atheism, um, whereas the problem of hellfire may lead those who are initially more religious to fall into disbelief. And so he, this is again why he addresses this at length so as to avoid atheism or disbelief. Now, there are many types of evil. Um, really, Ibn Qayyim uh, divides it principally into five uh, types. The first is privation, and this is um, pursued by many uh, uh, scholars uh, in this field. And privation means a lack of or dearth. And so privation of knowledge means ignorance or privation, justice, injustice. And those are types of evil. Obviously, anything disassociated from the Holy Lord is uh, evil. The perpetration of what the Holy Lord has prohibited or the neglect or abandonment of what he has commanded are also types of evil. And then misusing or power in an inappropriate way. Um, so he gives an example of fire. If it burns what it's supposed to burn, then it's good. But if it burns something it's not supposed to, destroys it, then that becomes a relative evil in that particular circumstance. Now, Ibn Qayyim, again, um, emphasizes God's holiness and righteousness, uh, brings verses from the Quran, in thy hand is good, all good, thou art able to do all things. And the Prophet Muhammad wasallam said, all goodness is in your hands, and evil cannot be attributed to you. Blessed and exalted are you. So, and then Imam Qayyim discusses and describes many of God's beautiful names that illustrate this further. 
God is Al Qudus, the Holy One that's self um, evident and explicit. Um, God is the most just. Again, uh, God does no injustice. God is Al Salam. So this entails two meanings. First of all, He is um, above any fault, deficiency, um, or inadequacy. And also the second meaning is that his creation are free from any injustice um, from him. And that's why, you know, he bestows peace. Um, God is Al-Ali, the Most High. And so he is above any evil um, or deficiency. And God is Al-Mutakabir. And one of the meanings that Ibn Qayyim mentions is that um, God is proud above doing any injustice because he is holy again. And finally, and we're going to discuss this further, God is Al-Hamid, the one deserving of all praise. And so if his creation commandments entail wise purposes, then that, um, that justifies him being the most praiseworthy. Now, God's beautiful names and glorious attributes subsist within him, and his actions result from them. Again, all of God's actions of Alihi are good, pure good, just, advantageous, and wise. There is no evil within them from any aspect whatsoever, um, according to Ibn Qayyim, and they are beloved and pleasing to him. But then Ibn Qayyim differentiates what God enacts, so mafa'ulatihi, and this means the creation or creatures are different than his act of creation and or creating. And so um, what is enacted is subject into that division into good or not. Ibn al-Qayyim as well as Ibn Taymiyyah differentiate between God's religious will, which dictate his religious commandments and what he loves, um, differentiate that from his ontological will, which encompasses all that occurs in reality. Uh, and there's one chapter in the book which lists out um, 12 terms it showing the uh, God's religious will um, in that uh, respective term versus his ontological will. For instance, you know, God uh, sends or Baratha. So the religious will is that God sends his messengers. But then there's also God sent, for instance, Nebuchadnezzar uh, to uh, destroy. And that's his ontological will. And there are many other terms, as I mentioned. Yeah. So, but it's important to differentiate between those two. Um, so now, um, after those brief introductory uh, slides and remarks, um, I'd like to go through Ibn Qayyim's uh, theodicies. Now, as you can see, they're quite extensive, and um, but uh, we'll discuss e each one of these um, uh, briefly. Um, the divine names theodicy, including wise purposes, I've alluded to. And then there are divine signs and divine love theodicy. The uh, greater uh, good theodicy already alluded to as well. Testing or tribulation theodicy is a well-known one as well as the free will theodicy. And then um, we'll go through educative theodicy. Um, Ibn Qayyim does not um, um, discuss the free will theodicy as much, but um, uh, the educative theodicy um, and the greater reward community theodicy does. Um, he also uh, briefly discusses retribution theodicy. Um, he does discuss the mystery theodicy quite a bit, um, and we'll uh, conclude with that as well as the uh, best of all possible worlds theodicy debate. It's interesting because, you know, the free will theodicy is one that we commonly hear the one that I most commonly hear from uh, from philosophers today, especially after Alvin Quantinga's, uh, you know, contributions uh, a few decade, decades ago uh, to the topic. So uh, it's a breath of fresh air to be exposed to different theodicies right now in this presentation, because I'm very accustomed to listening to the free will one, so it's good to know. Yeah. I, I, I'm not upset that I didn't play to spend too much time on it, so it's for the purpose of learning something yeah. new as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, the, the issue is um, the Martesilis, um, adopted really a free will theodicy, uh, but then they also, you know, kind of said that, you know, that human beings create their acts good. Yeah, yeah. And they found evil. the problems there. Yeah. And so I think Ibn Qayyim, as well as others, 
distance themselves from that. But he did maintain that free, human beings are free. Um, and, you know, he, uh, for instance, um, re responded and argued against Fakhreddin Razi, who um, was more deterministic Jabr, you know, yeah. um, theologian. Soft, soft Jabr, yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Right. Yeah. Um, so, um, so to start with the divine names, uh, theodicy, um, Ibn al-Qayyim mentions that uh, God has many beautiful names and absolute perfection occurs through God manifesting the consequences of these beautiful names. So we can see this most clearly in these kind of paired names of God, if you will. Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a nafir and a bar. He is the one who grants benefit, and he is the one who causes harm. Now, when God causes harm, it's only within his justice. It's never unjust. Um, and all of these names uh, are likewise um, carried out um, in setting of justice. So he is an muqaddam. He advances the believers. You know, on the day of judgment, he will. He's an muakhir. He. Uh, defers the disbelievers, same thing al Mu'az, he honors the believers, abases and the, the disbelievers, al Rafir al Khafid. Um, now, as far as um, al Marti al Mani, he grants both the believers and the disbelievers according to his wisdom and for uh, many wise purposes. Um, is the uh, al Muhyi and al Mumi, the life giver and the life taker. Uh, next, Ibn Qayyim discusses that uh, God is Al-Malik. He is the true and righteous king. Al-Malik Al-Haq, Al-Malik Al-Qudus. And Ibn Qayyim states, you know, how can one who does not command and forbid, reward and punish, bestow and withhold, grant glory to some, abase or humiliate others, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Send messengers throughout his kingdom, you know, be characterized as a king. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the king. And so he carries out all of these actions. Um, and then he also adds that God forgives sins, relieves calamities, cures those who are ill, liberates those who are suffering, gives aid to those who are oppressed, delivers those who are distressed, enriches those who are poor, answers supplications, cancel out offenses, strengthens one who's weak, among others. These are all consistent with his. And, and none of that would be possible if we didn't have what we claim is evil uh, in the world. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And we'll touch on that a little bit further as well. But the ultimate objective of all these actions of God, as well as creating command, are to provo provide, prove his divine oneness. Um, and, and so this is really, um, the again, the ultimate objective, and that all other claimed deities are false and impossible. Ibn al-Qayyim uh, mentions that God is the most praiseworthy, al-Hamid, as we uh, discussed. Um, now, God has praised himself in four instances in the Quran, you know, starting with Surat al-Fatiha, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. So uh, he's praising himself for being the almighty Lord, for his perfect sovereignty, for creating the heavens and earth, and for revealing his book. Alhamdulillahi alladhi anzal ala abdihi al-kitaba. Um, now, he praises himself, and he commanded his servants to praise him. Um, and this is due to the fact, Ibn Qayyim maintains, that his actions encompass praiseworthy objectives and outcomes that make him deserving of that praise. Um, now, Ibn Qayyim states further, if, if an act is done by an agent without intention, wise purpose, or advantage, then it's not considered praiseworthy. If it's, you know, for instance, like the philosophers maintain that this world has emanated from God. You know, that's not praiseworthy for, uh, on, on behalf of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if an act is done with intention, wise purpose, and advantage, then it is considered to be praiseworthy. Um, and so that's what Ibn Qayyim is maintaining. Next, as we've discussed, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-Hakim, and wisdom is one of his attributes. Now, um, there's nothing like God, whether in his essence, his attributes, or his actions. And this is, you know, acknowledged by everyone. But Ibn Qayyim maintains furthermore that God's wisdom is not like that of his creation, and his actions are not similar to theirs. And because Allah subhanahu wa is omniscient and omnipotent, then his actions are wiser and more perfect. 
Um, he alone possesses perfect knowledge and omnipotence, and therefore his wisdom follows suit. Um, and if his wisdom was absent, then that would result in inappropriate outcomes. And so, which would be obviously a deficiency in adequacy, which he is exalted above. And that, therefore, it's clear in Ibn Qayyim's eyes that these perfect attributes, that God's perfect attributes are designated, you know, with wisdom so as to result in appropriate outcomes. Now, um, I'm going to briefly touch on this, but Ibn Qayyim goes through in detail, um, you know, 21 evidences um, within the Quran and Sunnah that prove that God has wise purposes. Um, you know, for instance, you know, the verses such as the judgment and ordering of the Almighty, the omniscient, the revelation of the book is from God, the Almighty most wise. He also gives specific examples in the Quran where uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states the words hikmah or k, k meaning, you know, for that reason. Um, min ajid, same thing. La'allah, so that, you know, whenever you read these terms in the Quran, you should be thinking, this is pointing to a wise purpose that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has in both his creating and communion. Imam Qayyim also adds that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sometimes mentions the reason that he commanded something or the particular reason um, for an act of his. So, for instance, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we never destroyed a township until it had its warners for a reminder, for we were never oppressors. God is never unjust. Um, that is, that township disbelieved in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and worshipped other deities. Ibn Qayyim also mentions that God alludes to the presence of a barrier as being the reasons for an absence of an uh, ontological or religious ruling. So here, and this is relevant to our topic, specifically, if God were to enlarge the provision for his servants, they would surely rebel in the earth, but he sends down by measure as he wills. He is informed a seer of his servants. So here, suffering and dearth, poverty may be to uh, prevent and avoid servants from rebelling or disbelieving in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And moreover, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has criticized those who think that he has not originated the creation for an objective or wise purpose, deemed you that we had created you for not, and that you would not be returned to us. Uh, and, and I think just to, and just to clarify, uh, clarify this point, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, uh, Ibn al-Qayyim's contention with the Ash'aris here, um, because uh, I think that what the Asharis they would claim that yes, uh, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is not is not is not driven by purpose when He acts. They see that as a deficiency, and I and we're not going to delve into that because you know the, we'll be digressing from the topic. Um, but what they do claim is that after He has created what He has created, uh, wisdom is then subsequently attached to uh, what it is that He created. So they would deny that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is um, driven by purpose prior to the act of creation, but after he has created, uh, it would attach subsequently. So, so Ibn al-Qayyim is um, criticizing that particular point, not that Ash'aris would say, yeah, there is no purpose in anything that exists today. Um, so just for, I just want to add that clarification yeah. for those who, are, who may not have a background um, yeah. Uh, 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 on this uh, dispute, theological dispute. Yeah, and I would add to that, you know, I've seen five different approaches that the Ash'aris pursue, and one of them is, as you've mentioned, that mm -hmm. the, the wise purpose is not a motivator for mm -hmm. that action of his. Um, okay, um, then Ibn Qayyim points out that God commanded us to ponder and contemplate his words, commandments, prohibition, legal limits, had these not contained wisdoms, advantages, desired objectives, praiseworthy outcomes, there would be no reason to do so. And finally, he alludes to God's response to um, the, you know, the angels uh, when they inquired, uh, wilt thou place uh, therein one who will do harm and shed blood while we him thy praise and sanctify these? And God's response was, surely I know that which ye not know. Um, so Imam Qayyim states, if God's actions were devoid of any wisdoms, objectives, or advantages, uh -huh. the angels would not have they would have known better than to ask this type of question or would not have asked this type of question in the first place. Mm. 
Okay, so uh, moving on, and this is uh, something that Ibn Qayyim points out a lot, is that, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a tawab, he's a rahim, al ghafur al afu al halim, and he loves to uh, manifest his uh, forbearance, patience, perseverance, uh, vast mercy, and generosity uh, to his servants. So in, in particular, there's a hadith of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, where the person is stranded in, his de- in the desert and uh, loses his riding animal. And finally, you know, he despairs and becomes despondent, but then the riding animal comes back to him. And uh, Imam Qayyim states um, that, you know, according to that hadith, God is happier with the repentance of his servant than can be uh, measured or imagined. Uh, the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, also said in an authentic hadith, if you did not commit sins, God would dispense with you and create another people uh, who would and uh, would commit sins. They would ask for forgiveness, forgiveness and he would forgive them. And so again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves to uh, manifest his um, forgiveness. And as for the disbelievers, Imam Qayyim states that despite the blasphemies and lies of the disbelievers, God will accept their repentance. And had it not been for God's provisions and his forgiveness, the creation would not have even originally been brought into existence. Um, next, um, Imam Qayyim you know, uh, mentions divine signs, uh, theodicy here. And so the creation of those who oppose his message, God's messengers, deny them, show hostility towards them, lead to the com- leads to the complete manifestation of his signs, wondrous powers, and subtle works, you know, miracles. Um, these signs are proof of God's omnipotence, omniscience, and wisdom. So he gives many well-known examples, like the flood that drowned the disbelievers in Noah, uh, the parting of the sea and the drowning of Pharaoh and his army, uh, the other nine signs which occurred beforehand, uh, the sign where Abraham was thrown into the fire, but God made it cool and peaceful for him, and then saved him from the disbelieving people. He also mentions that the signs in the story of Joseph and morals um, and wise purposes exceed a thousand. Um, and finally, he um, discusses all the great signs that were associated with the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and the companions when they defeated the polytheists of, Qur- of Quraysh in the Battle of Badr, as well as other battles. And in the end, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them victory. The Prophet Muhammad liberated Mecca, entered the Kaaba, uh, accompanied by all of the immigrants and, um, and Muhajirin wal Ansar supporters, while the angels were above them and the revelation of God was coming down upon it. Uh, next, um, divine love theodicy. So, God's love is the highest type of honor, Ibn Qayyim states. His wisdom therefore dictated that he would settle Adam and his offspring in an abode where some could attain and be honored with his love, which is, again, is his greatest blessing. Um, now, there are many elite um, stations and uh, levels uh, for the uh, believers, you know, being... A Rasul is the highest uh, uh, messenger. Uh, next is being a prophet, um, being a friend of God's. Um, but then also he mentions that, you know, um, he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke directly to uh, Moses. Um, and again, he established amongst them friends, saints, martyrs, believing servants, and elites, all whom he loves and who love him. And Ibn Qayyim mentions there are 10 groups whom God loves, and these are the pious, al-muttaqin, the devout, al-muhsinin, the repentant, al-tawabin, those who purify themselves, and those who work to purify others, those who thank him, those who rely on him, uh, those who are benevolently equitable, al-muqsitin, al-muqsitin, um, those who follow the Prophet Muhammad, وسلم, and those who wage battle in a unified manner in his path. Um, so all 10 of these groups are mentioned in the Quran as being uh, uh, beloved to God. And again, enduring hardships and adversities, which many of these groups display, allows them to attain God's love and pleasure. And then he compares between 
God's pleasure with them versus God's displeasure and anger uh, with uh, Satan and the disbelievers. And he says that, you know, the pleasure with the believers is greater than the anger with the disbelievers. Now, we're going to move to the greater good theodicy. And so Ibn Qayyim maintains that God's creating and commanding are based upon attaining what is purely advantageous or what is preponderantly so and allowing the lesser good to elapse. And so, again, um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created this world to uh, result in greater goods that we're going to discuss here. Um, some of the reasons that Ibn Qayyim mentions for pains and hardships are uh, God's beneficence and mercy, justice and wisdom, um, type of reformation and preparation for some good that will occur later, or to prevent some greater pain. And he alludes to the fact that human perfections can only be achieved through um, pain and hardship, whether that's attaining knowledge, um, displaying courage, um, having being ascetic, uh, possessing chastity, being chaste, forbearance, uh, valor, um, patience, and righteousness. And, you know, I mean, uh, touching on that last point, I mean, th this is... You know, there, there, there are actual studies that actually demonstrate this. Uh, if you don't mind, I'm, I'm just going to read out something here. Please. Uh, um, so there are uh, there are two psychologists. Uh, one of them, I hope I pronounced their names correctly, Will Gervais and Ara Norenzian. The, the, they published a peer-reviewed article called The Origins of Disbelief. And they're tr trying to draw connections between material comfort comfort and God and religious and religiosity. So uh, here's an interesting quote. They said, um, they're talking about apathyism. Apathyism is not caring about God, not caring about religion. So they said that apathyism arises from conditions of existential security. It has long been hypothesized that widespread human suffering and threats to human welfare encourage motivational states that make many religious beliefs and practices deeply comforting and meaningful. In the laboratory, several interrelated existential threats have been found to increase religious motivations, awareness of death, suffering, perceptions of randomness and uncertainty, perceived loss of personal control and social isolation, intensify belief in a personal God who offers immortality, meaning, external control, social bonding, and stability. These effects have important real-world implications. One longitudinal study found that religious commitment increased among New Zealanders immediately after a severe earthquake, but only among those citizens who were directly affected by the earthquake. Religious engagement is far stronger in societies marked by poverty, high infant mortality, short lifespans, economic inequality, and non-existent or unreliable government services and social safety nets. Conversely, as social conditions become more existentially secure, religious belief and attendance decline. Even within the same society, religiosity declines over time as conditions become more secure. Some of the least religious societies on earth are found in contemporary Northern Europe and Scandinavia. Not surprisingly, these are perhaps the most existentially secure societies in the history of humanity. Where life is safe and predictable, people are less motivated to turn to gods for, for succor. Or, uh, yeah. Um, so, so here, I mean, I mean, the, the, I mean, this is just something that can even be academically um, uh, demonstrated. You know, uh, precisely what Nuhay is saying. So it's not just some, you know. Um, presumption that we're making. I mean, this is factually demonstrated. So I just want to, you know, kind of uh, weigh in on that. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. Right. Yeah. Um, okay. And and that kind of ties into the, this next slide, actually, because, um, you know, uh, instead of them thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and thanking God for the blessings that they have, you know, some people become um, further away from uh, belief, as, as those studies mentioned um, but um, 
here, this um, you know slide you know refers to a tradition uh, mentioned in by Imam Ahmad, where Adam asked, "O oh Lord, why did you not make all of your servants equal?" And Allah Subhanahu wa Taala replied, "I love to be thanked." So Imam Qayyim states that you know had everyone um, uh, be given um, an equal share of his of God's blessings and well-being, then the blessed individual would not know its value and would not express his gratitude. Um, one of the strongest reasons and causes for gratitude to be expressed from the servant is him witnessing another in an opposite state of his perfect and successful state. So again, you know, some people through attaining, you know, blessings are more thankful to God. And some people though, rebel and disbelieve in God as that prior um, verse uh, that we discussed mentioned and uh, is mentioned by those um, academics. Ibn Qayyim states, uh, God loves to be truly thanked in every way. And there's no doubt that his saints exhibit a greater number of ways of showing gratitude to him, which would have not have occurred otherwise and have a more perfect level of gratitude to him. Now, um, the, these um, injustice, maltreatment, uh, oppression, allow one, again, to worship God through patience, forgiveness, suppression of one's anger, the presence of poverty and need, uh, allows one to worship God by giving charity, giving preference to others, consoling them. Um, and so, again, all of those um, could not occur in a world without suffering, um, dearth, or evil. Ibn Qayyim states the patience of his of the messengers and their followers, they're striving, they're enduring many types of adversities and hardship for God's sake, as well as the various types of worship connecting to calling others to Islam and showing them the straight path could not have occurred if it were not for the existence of the disbelievers. And so um, also, you know, the presence of those who show enmity to the believers leads the, those same believers to seek refuge in God and ask for God's protection. Um, so, um, now, Ibn Qayyim repeats throughout the book and many books that um, there's a bridge um, of hardships and fatigue or a bridge of suffering and, and um, trials, um, and, and you have to traverse that bridge in order to reach paradise. Um, so here he says, God's wisdom has settled on the fact that bliss, luxury, and relaxation cannot be attained except by traversing a bridge of hardships and fatigue. It is for this reason that paradise is surrounded by adversities while hellfire is enveloped by desires. And then Ibn Qayyim, he discusses a greater good, and that is that true love of God is only achieved when one prefers God um, more than anything else. And, you know, if you notice um, when you, you encounter difficulties, you have to uh, assess yourself. You have to um, re-focus um, um, your in intentions, your actions, your thoughts um, to... Um, to, and devote yourself to um, uh, God's path. So Ibn Qayyim states, it's only through enduring great difficulties in his path and seeking his uh, contentment that this true love is achieved and known to be truly established within one's heart. All of this will intensify the power of one's love, allow it to become more firmly rooted and lead to uh, fruitful actions. Sustained love in the face of many obstacles, barriers, and distractions is a true beneficial love. But a love that, on the other hand, is contingent upon well-being, blessings, pleasure, attaining one's desires is not a true love. Um, and it will not hold up in the face of difficulties and obstacles. So, Ibn al um, states there's an immense difference between one who worships God in times of joy ease and well-being only, and one who worships him in times of joy and hardship, ease and difficulty, well-being and tribulation. So. Now, this uh, ties into uh, some of the upcoming slides for uh, testing theodicy, but he, Ibn Qayyim um, adds that the presence of evil will differentiate the truthful one from the liar, um, as well as those who desire his pleasure and worship him in all states, 
uh, tying into the last slide, from those who only worship him in a corrupted fashion, only in good times. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, among uh, humankind is he who worships God upon a narrow marge, so that if good comes to him, he is content therewith. But if a trial befalls him, he falls away utterly. He loses both the world and the hereafter. That is the sheer loss. And so the objective really for the believers is that they are remain even killed through, you know, thick and thin, as you would say, um, and um, continue to be devoted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Ibn Qayyim states elsewhere that this is really the secret reason uh, for these trials and tests to differentiate clearly those who have true faith from those who try to deceive and those who are believers from disbelievers. Um, referring to the verse that God may separate the wicked from the good. The wicked he will place peace upon peace and heap them together and consign them unto hell. hell such verily are the losers. And, and he makes an interesting point here that I'd like to put forth, and that is that those who only worship God in uh, ways that they love or desire are in reality only worshiping themselves. And, and so, you know, if you encounter difficulties, whether it's um, from the disbelievers or you encounter difficulties when you're trying to work with the believers to achieve some objective, that those difficulties, you know, make you devote yourself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more and, and realize that you are um, but a servant of his working to um, achieve good in this world. So moving on to testing theodicy, um, Ibn Qayyim alludes to the fact that God informed us in many chapters and verses that it is inevitable that he will test us and put his creation through trials. And so Ibn Qayyim mentions all the uh, messengers listed here, Noah, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad. May God bless them all and all of their trials and tribulations and how they remain patient. They continue to strive. And he alludes to the fact that this is the state of Everyone who uh, follows the Prophet Muhammad, everyone has their share of these tribulations. Then he discusses um, Surah Al-Ankabut in depth, um, and he say, says, um, God began it by criticizing those who imagine that they will not have to undergo testing and trials um, just because they claimed uh, that they possess faith. Uh, God rejects those who fail to be faithful to him or to follow his messengers due to their fact due to their fear of trials um the disbelievers imagine and suppose that by shunning away uh, faith and denying his message that they will avoid trials and tests in reality god possesses in his power the ability to put them through greater and more difficult trials tests and punishments and obviously Ibn Qayyim alludes to the fact that since it's inevitable you're going to encounter hardships and difficulties you might as well encounter it in this world. And that's what the believers have uh, chosen to do rather than encounter it in hellfire in the hereafter. God has made some of his servants test for others. Uh, we try some of them by others in the Quran, and we have appointed some of you as a test for others. So Ibn Qayyim states, God has made some of his saints as a test for his enemies, some of his enemies as a test for his saints, the kings as a test for their subjects and vice versa, men as a test for women, vice versa, affluent ones as a test for those who are poor and vice versa. He tested each group as opposite. So then Ibn Qayyim um, discusses an interesting uh, point um, that sometimes by allowing the servant to sin, the believer, you know, God is testing you um, by seeing your response to that feeling of being distant from him um, and that pain. So if you don't feel that uh, pain and distance, then, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, will not necessarily guide you to um, abandoning that uh, sin. So in such people who don't abandon that sin and don't feel that loss are not ready for an elevator rank. But if you do feel that pain and you feel like you've lost out on your spiritual life, then you will implore, beseech, supplicate to God to return you to it. And at that point, you confirm that you are worthy of a more lofty rank. And, and so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides and facilitates you to return to a more spiritual life um, and abandon that sin. So again, uh, moving on to the free will theodicy, Ibn Qayyim doesn't 
discuss it much, but he obviously affirms that human beings are free uh, to act as they uh, desire. And um, while also affirming that, uh, uh, while also affirming God's uh, decree and determination. And this is characteristic of Adam Sunnah and Jum'ah. Um, so Ibn al-Qayyim states that God's judgment and wisdom has dictated that he would favor Adam and his offspring over much of what he has created by making their worship of him more perfect than that of other creatures, since they worship him by following his commandments um, by their free choice, not out of compulsion or some necessity. And so he, um, Ibn Qayyim, uh, moreover, says that uh, their worship is the best grade and that their faith in the unseen is the only beneficial type of faith. And so again, this is a distinction and honor and um, um, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has uh, given to humanity, those who are believers. Uh, moving on to the educative theodicy, it's discussed by many. Um, and uh, Safar Chaudhry, who wrote a book, Islamic Theology and the Problem of Evil, uh, discussed it in depth as well. Um, Ibn al-Qayyim alludes to uh, the, that the presence of evil allows humanity uh, to recognize that they are but servants of um, the Almighty. So we are servants of, of God, and it's only God who alone is perfect and holy. And so here is another um, interesting point that he makes. You know, the existence of evils and, and sins allows one to recognize that um, they are deficient and it frees themselves from some idiocies that the scholars will uh, see, such as those who claim themselves um, to be uh, pre-eternal or that they are united with God, meaning their uh, monism, um, or incarnated in him. Sometimes some uh, religious scholars um, fall into that, and um, it, it's um, important to recognize that you are uh, a servant of God, and um, the existence of sins and faults um, should educate you to that. Um, Ibn Qayyim also mentions that uh, sins or evil may indirectly remove um, arrogance and pride from one's heart, uh, which would otherwise uh, result from one being impressed with their personal acts of uh, worship. Um, and so he mentions a hadith of the prophet that is sound according to Ibani. Um, if you did not sin, I would be afraid of something worse for you for you than that, and that is pride. Um, it also recognize, uh, allows the uh, individual to recognize um, his need for God's protection, help, and preservation. If the uh, true Lord does not protect the individual, then he'll inevitably become destroyed spiritually. Um, Ibn al-Qayyim, I would say, also does not discuss retribution theodicy in, in detail, but he does emphasize uh, God's justice when taking retribution um, so he alludes to the Prophet Muhammad uh, sallallahu alaihi wasallam's hadith: uh, "Your judgment upon me will be carried out, and your decree for me is just." Um, so that uh, latter uh, statement is proof that God um, is just in all His ontological decrees for His servants, whether good or harmful, pleasurable or painful, as well as His recompense for them. And it also shows that it's um, uh, necessary to have faith. And God's determination, as well as, again, God's decree being just. And he uh, mentions later that God is justified to the highest degree when he allows his servant to undergo hardships. Um, so moving on to uh, greater reward or communion theodicy, um, Imel Qayyim uh, alludes to, uh, a number of times to the fact that, you know, experiencing hardship, grief, difficulties of this world enables humanity to better appreciate the greatness and bliss of paradise. Um, and he says, had the believers only lived in the blissful abode of paradise, then they would not have appreciated its truth uh, worth. Um, he also uh, discusses um, that um, Adam, when he was um, uh, initially placed into uh, paradise, was promised by Allah that he would not um, experience hunger or thirst, 
that he wouldn't experience uh, the sun's heat. Um, but then after Adam, you know, uh, lapsed um, and sought repentance from God, then it was that God distinguished him, uh, chose him, guided him. Um, and, and so the ultimate return of human uh, believers is to uh, uh, paradise um, in a in a more appreciative uh, state, uh, you know, according to Ibn al-Qayyim. Um, he also alludes, uh, alludes to how God has made paradise composed of, of uh, many levels, some higher than others. Um, and, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's wisdom dictates that all of the levels be occupied, which can only occur if deeds are varied. So if there's a great spectrum of what one, uh, the believers and righteous can do in this world. And that's because of the presence of, you know, adversities, evils, hardships. Um, so here we're going to discuss the best of all possible worlds, uh, Theodos. Now, it began with um, Ghazali, um, who was in the 11th century, 10th and 11th century. Um, and his dictum was that there is not in possibility anything uh, more wonderful than um, abda than what exists. Now, um, Eric Ormsby investigates um, the views of the Muslim scholars um, afterwards, um, and he mentioned Ibn Qayyim, but he left it blank. So he, he kind of wasn't, I think, sure what to attribute to him, because Ibn Qayyim, to be uh, uh, sure, does not directly discuss this uh, dictum. Now, um, just to mention, um, John Hoover um, it did investigate Ibn Taymiyyah's um, uh, approach to that dictum, and he maintains that Ibn Taymiyyah mentioned it three times, um, and in two of those he disagreed with it, uh, but in one of those he agreed with it. Um, and so I would contend that Ibn Qayyim disagreed with this dictum, uh, but not outwardly, because his methodology is really never to criticize the major scholars by name, uh, Ghazali being one of them, um, and if he disagrees with Ibn Taymiyyah, he won't mention that either. You really have to kind of search that out. Um, and some of the reasons that I would um, uh, list uh, for his disagreement with that is, is first of all, Ibn Qayyim uses the word dazzling or wonderful, badira, but only in reference to God's wisdom, hikmatuhu al-badira. He never utilizes that word to describe this world. And, and that is, uh, I would maintain, purposeful on his part. Um, next, um, he differentiates, again, as we discussed, between God's actions versus what he enacts. And he maintains that God's wisdom as well as his actions are dazzling. Again, he, he used, utilizes that word uh, nearly 15 times uh, in the translation, um, whereas that which he enacts this world and what it contains may be, again, divided into aspects that are good, wonderful, or not. Um, number three, Ibn Qayyim emphasized that God only created this world as a bridge to the hereafter. And we kind of mentioned that. Um, and you have to traverse that bridge. But the, the point of this world is to um, allow the believers to equip themselves with good deeds. Um, and number four is that Ibn Qayyim mentions uh, that higher degrees of God's beneficence and grace can always be postulated. Th this is more in when he responds to the um, uh, uh, Martezilis who uh, maintain uh, divine omnibenevolence. But the point here is that characterizing this world, even paradise, as being the best is only congruent in some aspects. Neither can be generally deemed as such. God can always create higher uh, levels um, and, and uh, bestow more grace. Um, but again, God has constructed this world and paradise in accordance with his wisdom and, again, grace. So I would uh, reconcile Ibn Qayyim's and Ghazali's viewpoint by saying what is good in this world is more wonderful the good in this world is more wonderful than it good had existed alone. And God has many dazzling wisdoms in mixing good and evil herein. Now, uh, just uh, by point, um, Safaruk, he alludes to Ibn Qayyim stating in Miftah Dar Saada that this world is the most perfect and balanced system, Ahsan Nizam, or that this 
system that God has created is the best. And this proves that God is the most perfect creator. Um, but again, this alludes to God being the best creator and that he has created the best system or order so as to achieve the wise purposes that he has dictated. Uh, so if one were to say that Ibn Qayyim is an optimist, meaning that Ibn Qayyim says that this is the best possible world, as John Hoover says about him, it should be qualified that Ibn Qayyim would say that this world is the best system to achieve the wise purposes that God, who's the perfect creator, has ordained for it. Now, Ibn Qayyim, to conclude, he discusses um, this mystery theodicy and in, in really the beginning, middle, and end. Um, and he so he repeatedly states that people are not privy or even able to understand the details uh, of God's wisdom and that God's perfection wisdom refused, allowing his creation to be privy to all of his wisdoms. Um, and, you know, he again uh, bids us to recall God's response to the angels and maintaining that God's actions and rulings contain wise purposes does not concomitantly require that his creation must know them all. And he finally says, you know, to those who deny God's wise purposes, their ability to perceive God's wisdom is less than the degree to which a bat can see the light of the sun. So God has informed us of the general and grand wise purposes and meanings of what he has created and commanded and prescribed while leaving aside in many cases the details and particulars, according to Ibn Qayyim, and he concludes those who are rational should use what they know of his wise purposes as proof that there is uh, wisdom for that which they do not understand. They should realize that there is wise purpose for everything that God has created, commanded, and prescribed. As for the detailed secrets of those wise purposes, they are not attainable for all of humanity. Rather, God provides insight to those whom he wills, those whom he wishes of what of his creation to what he wills. And we should be uh, content. Um, at least that is a uh, part of Ihsan. Um, now, it is um, in accordance with the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad that one of the principles of faith is contentment with predestination, whether good or evil, pleasing or painful. Um, Ibn Qayyim emphasized that we should be thankful for the uh, blessings and that it is preferable to be content with ontological, some ontological decrees like hardships. And again, that that is part of Ihsan. But it's impersonal, impermissible to be content with some ontological degrees. You know, you shouldn't be content with sins or fault, which anger God is angered by, even if they occur by his decree of predestination. Okay, so I think that uh, will conclude um, our discussion uh, on um, the book Ibn Qayyim and Josiah on divine wisdom and the problem of evil. And now I'm going to uh, kind of briefly discuss. Um, some um, elements um, from uh, a book that I wrote, Revival of Piety Through an Islamic uh, Theodicy. Um, this also is um, um, segmented out to 15 chapters with an epilogue um, and, and really into three parts. Now, um, I kind of see the problem of evil as being more than uh, just the... Um, allowance of evil by God or um, or an attribution of evil to God. But I also see it as the uh, attribution of evil to Islam, to the Prophet Muhammad, to the uh, companions. And so I want to respond really to all of these, what I would call problems of evil. Um, and also, it, it's my objective to really show um, as I do kind of throughout the book, but also by um, showing in part two, the Muslim approaches and non-Muslim approaches to the problems of evil, that um, Islam really provides the best um, comprehensive uh, theodicy um, to uh, kind of repudiate the problem of evil much better um, than um, Christian approaches or all the other approaches, even though they're... Um, 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 uh, books, uh, Christian books are, are uh, Christian scholars have devoted much more time uh, to that um, pursuit 
Um, and again, I, I think the one of the major reasons is uh, that the majority of Islamic scholars over the ages have been Ashari's, and so that has um, not been a concern of theirs. And then I conclude in part three, uh, discussing Hellfire uh, and uh, Paradise. So we're just going to discuss a few um, um, issues, um, and I'll allude here briefly to uh, the fact that I do mention uh, the uh, different theodicies of um, the uh, Muslim scholars. So I start out with Ibn Qayyim, as we uh, discussed uh, in way more depth uh, today. Um, the, I also allude to the Qadiris and Martezinis, and we briefly mentioned that they had a free will theodicy that, whereby um, they maintain that God, uh, that the human beings create their acts of good and evil. Um, the Ash'aris, we discussed that and, and need not discuss it um, more uh, for our purposes today. Um, the Maturidis, you know, they really did seek to um, have a uh, divine wise purposes. Um, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places everything in its appropriate um, uh, place, uh, as they would say. And, and so um, that is really in agreement in uh, what uh, Ibn Qayyim pursues. Uh, the Sufis uh, kind of think more, uh, you know, and there are different approaches, but that, you know, encountering adversity is important um, uh, and enables one to kind of rise up the spiritual ladder up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that, you know, if you're encountering adversary, adversity, at least according to Ibn Atallah Iskandari, then it's because you're either veiled from God or uh, you're veiled uh, because of your sins. Well, it's, interesting, it's interesting how you have uh, Ghazali, Imam Ghazali, separated from the Ashara. Uh, so is his view unique to him and wasn't adopted by any of the other Ashara? Well, I would say that the dictum that he uh, put forth was really the first time that anybody had said that, uh, that this is the best possible world, POC, as far as I know. And, and then it didn't gain traction within the Ashari school later on. Um, so it, it actually early on, um, it didn't gain traction, but over a few centuries, then it became the dominant view. Okay. Yeah. And and John Hoover he postulates um, that that uh, Ibn Taymiyyah's acceptance may have had some role in that, but he said it's difficult to ascertain that. You know. Um, um, Said Norsi is a, um, a contemporary um, or 20th century uh, Turkish scholar, and he also puts forth a divine names uh, theodicy as as well as some other um, privation theodicy, etc. And then th there are some other uh, Muslim theodicies um, that of Ibn Sina. I discussed that. It's problematic because it limits uh, God's power, and although he did not explicitly state that. God is not an omnipotent. Some of the um, basically conclusions that he uh, puts forth uh, would uh, suggest that. Um, and Shams Inati she states that he did not want to say that explicitly because that would incur the you know the wrath of the theologians. Obviously, um, now Ibn Arabi and um, Ibn Sabrin, um were monists to varying degrees, and, and they you know um, basically you know, will kind of uh, put forth a, uh, that this world is a, a mirror of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and, and therefore the, the, their type of um, monism um, and that um, really the kind of evils that exist in this world are not a privation um, that, um, you know, it occurs because of uh, from are not a privation of what God has created, rather a privation from Himself. Um, and I discuss that in my book um, as well. And Muhammad Iqbal is a pan, um, pantheist, um, um, which um, is not, um, we won't be discussing that here. Now, um, again, the, the Chowdhury states that the enterprise of theodicy is itself under attack for doing nothing to ameliorate evil and suffering. So my, my uh, book, um, as the title suggests, tries to emphasize the importance of attaining piety and righteousness so as to avoid evil 
and minimize evil in this world, uh, in, a, in particular, uh, gratuitous evil that we're going to discuss here in a few slides. Now, gratuitous um, just means something that is without apparent reason or justification. Now, a gratuitous evil is evil that does not apparently or clearly lead to an immediate uh, greater good, or uh, alternatively is uh, an evil which God could have prevented without losing some greater good according to William Rowe. But I would contend, as Ibn Qayyim does, that there exists one or more indirect aspects by which wise purpose can eventually be seen um, that leads to the religious, uh, the righteous believers. But it might be at a future generation striving um, to overcome it. And these righteous deeds would not have been possible otherwise. Now, there are a lot of other reasons, um, some of which we'll discuss today. Um, but the perpetration of major sins leads to the to greater levels of evil, uh, even gratuitous evil. And if, if a society as a whole perpetrates major sins, then gratuitous evils will inevitably follow, particularly if they do not carry out the legal punishments. Um, we should not be surprised that they exist. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu he prophesies that evils will increase over time, you know, as a day of judgment approaches. Discord and trials fitan will become overwhelming and you know, killing will become widespread. Um, the drinking of alcohol and fornication will be widespread. So evil, uh, you know, increases. And, and I also mentioned another um, evidence for that in the book. Now, the Prophet Muhammad, he provided a solution as well as a warning saying, I swear by him in whose my hand is, uh, I swear by him in whose hand is my soul. Either you all enjoy what is good and forbid major sins, or God will send upon you a punishment. Even if you supplicate to him to remove this punishment, he will not answer you. And this corroborates it, um, many verses of the Bible. For instance, you know, um, the house of Israel and the house of Judah have broken my covenant, which I made with their fathers. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, behold, I will bring evil upon them, which they shall not be able to escape. And though they shall cry unto me, I will not pardon unto them. So, um, and we're going to discuss that a little bit more uh, gratuitous evil in an upcoming slide. But again, to go back to what um, you know we discussed about the elite, um, you could uh, divide them into eight groups according to the Quran, and you can see in many of these groups, um, it's really uh, the definition of those groups involves you know doing something to strive against evil. Now, the prophets and the messengers, they have obviously did all of these acts, and they were the best of humanity. Um, but I would say the truth, truly faithful, the Siddiquan, they uh, deeply repudiate the principles and root causes of evil, forbid it, and strive against it. The martyrs uh, uh, self-evidently fight against evil and sacrifice themselves for God's sake. Um, the righteous saw the hound, they enjoin good, forbid evil, and withstand the harm of those who are evil. Um, the devout, the marcinuant, they avoid the major and intermediate sin and perform acts of devotion. The pious mutakon, they avoid the major sins and perform benevolent deeds. So all of these elite levels are defined by their um, striving against evil, their forbidding evil, or their avoidance of the major sins. Although they are only a small uh, minority of believers, um, the world as con construction as constructed leads to the highest levels of goodness being within them. And if you think about it, had evil not existed, then lower levels of goodness um, would have been present, All, even though there would have been a greater percentage of uh, people who were believers. Now, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said, you know, a benevolent deed is multiplied 10 to 700 times. Also, you know, consider the fact that God will transform the intermediate and minor sins of the righteous. Again, they do not incur any major sins. Um, so those sins that they do incur will be transformed into good deeds in the hereafter. And this allows them to reach much higher uh, ranks within paradise. And th that's, again, because of God's pleasure with them and God's love with them. 
Again, the greater the amount of evil, the greater the expanse and possibilities for the righteous believers to do good and strive against evil, that evil would have been less than those opportunities would have been less. Now, um, here, I'd like to discuss uh, something that Ibn Qayyim states and then uh, discuss something that I would go further with. So Ibn Qayyim emphasized many times, as we discussed previously, that God is pleased and is happy with the repentance of his servant. So I would go further and say that God's love of the resurgence of the religious of the religion is even greater than his love of repentance. So uh, repentance only involves regretting a sin and avoiding that evil in the future, whereas resurgence represents repentance followed by righteous deeds. And I would contend that the Quran alludes to it by, when it say, states, Taba wa aslaha, in a couple of verses, uh, uh, in three verses of the Quran, now, resurgence on a societal level in, involves repentance after a period of strangeness and distance from the Holy Lord, followed by carrying out you know, righteous deeds and forbidding others from major sins. And, um, but the resurgence of the religion is really the main objective, the ultimate objective, um, as evidence in the, um, the verse, and that there may spring from you a nation uh, who invite to goodness and join right conduct. Uh, conduct and forbid indecency. Such are they who um, are successful. Now, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam described God's love of a person repenting in a manner, as we discussed previously, according to the Hadith, and as Ibn Qayyim discusses, understandable to our minds and extrapolatable to this world. Um, on the other hand, if you look in the Revelation. Uh, God's pleasure with righteous, righteousness has never is not described in Revelation, um, and it will be contend that this is because God's love of righteousness is far more sublime, and um, and His reward is indescribable. Therefore, um, the love and pleasure that God has for resurgence, the combination of righteous deeds and, and repentance, similarly cannot be described fully for is so great. And if God loves one righteous and resurgent believer, then uh, and it's His love is so great. Then what about the resurgence of an entire group of righteous believers within a society? So, in conclusion, the resurgence of a society is so beloved to uh, the Holy Lord that He has created this world in such a manner composed of both good and uh, gratuitous evil. Uh, this can be further seen if you consider the. Uh, uh, prophetic hadith verily islam started as something strange Arib, and it will again revert to being strange just as it became um blessed Uba, uh, to the, are the strangers so the emergence of those who have faith and carry out righteous actions in these times is desired from a re religious perspective uh, since they are blessed and praiseworthy but the true religion can only become strange um, if gratuitous evil is allowed to occur. Um, and so the presence and allowance, again, of gratuitous evil leads to those times of strangers, which then indirectly results in subsequent um, emergence, manifestation of righteous believers in the best of humanity. So gratuitous evil may be without apparent reason for those living at that time, but ultimately it will result in indirect goods at a later time, a future generation of righteous believers. Um, I discuss a few cases of this and some um, instances where, um, particularly um, as the day of a judgment appear, um, comes near, that gratuitous evil may be allowed, um, you know, uh, where consider when Allah subhanahu ta'ala um, removes all the believers uh, from this world. Um, that gratuitous evil is out because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not want to bring the day of, of judgment upon um, any believer. But that's the only instance really where um, gratuitous evil does not uh, result in a future generation of righteous believers you know, working and striving against it. Finally, I'd like to talk about um, hypocrisy and the fact that Although Islamic scholars were very aware of the evils and discord that the hypocrites uh, perpetrated against the Muslims, um, they did not expound upon it in the context of the POC. Um, Ibn Qayyim 
mention does not mention the hypocrites by name, but he does state, which kind of alludes to hypocrisy, that sacrificing oneself for God's sake differentiates the truthful one from the liar and Kev, or those who have true uh, faith from those who try to deceive. As, as you know, the um, Quran mentions that the hypocrites try to deceive Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but you know, he will bring out their hypocrisy, and in that fashion, he um, will deceive them. Um, likewise, the non-Muslim authors did not mention hypocrisy when discussing their theodicies, but I will contend that elucidating um, hypocrisy in those who are hypocrites is one of the main reasons for allowing gratuitous evil. Hypocrisy cannot be elucidated in a world with lower degrees of evil. So just to give an example, if you consider like the early companions of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Mecca, they exemplify true faith. Uh, but they were subjected to great persecution, hardship, suffering, and evil. They were boycotted. Many were hungry. They feared for their safety. Many were tortured. Some were killed. Um, in this widespread presence of suffering and persecution prevented hypocrites from existing or joining the believers. Thus, hypocrisy did not exist again amongst the Meccan companions. Hypocrisy only existed during the Medina period um, where there was a worldly advantage to someone becoming a believer and where suffering and evil were comparatively less than the Meccan period. Um, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought out the deceit and disbelief um, in, in, in this uh, verse um, d demonstrates um, kind of the fact that whether you hide that which is in your breast or reveal it, God knows it and God is able to do all things but because Allah's Pantada is the most just he has dictated that he manifests to the hypocrites their deceit and hypocrisy and so one of the most significant means to elucidate hypocrisy is through the allowance of war. So Ibn Qayyim, you know, alludes to, again, fighting for God's sake being you know, the apex of worship. Um, now, if humans had only been good, if no evil existed, the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not have commanded them to fight against each other, uh, for that would be unjust and unwise. Um, you know, certainly Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands of believers to be merciful and benevolent with other believers. And so God created this world with both good, evil, and gratuitous evil. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said, whoever dies without having thought, nor having even thought about doing so, dies within a division, Sharba of hypocrisy. So only fighting or truly and sincerely thinking about doing so, which only God knows, allows one to avoid uh, hypocrisy. Many think themselves to be good, but many, in fact, are insistent to the Holy Lord. So God's allowance of evil, even gratuitous evil, results in conditions where the hypocrites are manifest as not being willing to strive, fight, or even think about doing so. Had gratuitous evils not existed, then hypocrisy would not be manifested to those so deluded or arrogant to acknowledge they harbor. And with that, I'll um, conclude um, with some thoughts of Ibn Qayyim and um, myself. So um, Ibn Qayyim really provides the most comprehensive theodicy of the Islamic and classical scholars, in, in my view. He considers the divine means theodicy at the apex, and he emphasizes that God is the most wise and that he has many wise purposes in allowing evil to exist in this world. He also discusses you know, divine love, divine signs, he emphasizes the testing theodicy and greater good theodicy. And he maintains that the distinguished and noble characteristics displayed by the righteous elite of humanity can only be attained um, by existing world where they would have to endure and strive as they do. Ibn Qayyim repeats that paradise can only be uh, attained by traversing a bridge composed of trials and tribulations, suffering and hardship. But in reality, these uh, represent need to mercy on and the blessing for us. Um, and finally, he uh, discusses many times the mystery theodicy and um, that, again, we should realize that there's a wise purpose for everything that God has created to me and described. The detailed secrets of these wise purposes are not attainable for all humanity, but God does 
provide insight to those whom he wishes of his creation to what he is. To conclude, um, the Revival of Piety book, there are many problems of evil that um, I discuss and respond to. Um, but an emphasis is placed on piety and righteousness as well as true faith uh, to minimize evil in this world. Uh, gratuitous evil, again, allows it indirectly the emergence of the righteous and truly faithful. It illustrates the importance of enjoying good, forbidden evil, according God's commandments. Um, it indirectly allows a resurgence of the religion. Um, and, and that resurgence occurs once a critical um, mass of, of righteous um, is present in the society. This resurgence is so beloved to the Holy Lord, um, and, and it's carried out by um, the what about blessed strangers. And uh, finally, uh, for this presentation, it allows elucidation of those who are hypocrites. So God has created this world in such a manner that it elucidates each and every hypocrite at all times and all places. To leave even one single hypocrite manifest as such is contradictory to the wisdom of the most wise and almighty Lord. Ultimately, the true nature of each person is elucidated as a result of the construct of this world in the presence of tribulations and gratuitous evils within. And with that, I'd like to thank you, Hassan, again, for inviting me and allowing me to present this work. Barakallahu fikum, Talal, for this uh, wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, you know, it's packed with um, many gems and will serve, inshallah, as a great asset to be shared with Muslim apologists who want to strengthen their responses to this argument and will also be greatly beneficial to share with ordinary Muslims uh, personally struggling with the problem of evil. And what I love about this holistic approach to addressing the problem of evil is that it packs within it several theodicies, and this will broaden the appeal of this comprehensive response to as many people uh, as possible, because some people might not be persuaded by some of the theodicies put forth as responses uh, just yet. Um, and I also love how this presentation isn't uh, spiritually dry, uh, you know, but it's also designed to uh, enhance our spiritual connection to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala and uh, better realize His. Uh, you know, majestic greatness and uh, beautiful attributes. And, you know, this is essential for Muslim apologists to consider, you know, as we should not be blindly copy-pasting from non-Muslim philosophers and trying to emulate them in their responses to the problem of evil and only do some minor tweaks here and there by Islamicizing uh, our language. I mean, rather, we need to approach this topic Islamically with a uh, bottom-up approach. So, you know, when, once again, Jazakallah khairan for your efforts, Talal, and, you know, we hope to see more of your published work uh, in the future and possibly get you back on blogging theology again uh, to discuss them. And uh, uh, be before we close the session, are there any final words that you would like to uh, leave our listeners with or be ready to close? No, that was very well said, uh, Bassam, and so Again, I'd just like to thank you for inviting me, allowing to present this, and uh, I would be happy to come back and discuss any other uh, work. Thanks Thanks again. Again. And with that, I'm going to part you and our listeners with the Islamic readings of Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.